in a small fishing village that lay at the uh, mouth of a turbulent river, a cry rang out, boy overboard. And the people of the town gathered quickly at the, uh, at the river t- to see this boy floundering in the water. Every mother was wondering, is it my son? And the strongest swimmer in the village volunteered to go rescue him. And so he tied a, a rope around his waist and he dove in, and as he dove in, he threw the other end of the rope into the crowd. And the people watched as he swam with strong strokes to the boy and, and, and put his arms around him, and they cheered when he got there. Then he turned around to the people and said, pull the rope in. And people looked from one to the other, who has the rope? In all the excitement of watching the rescue, nobody had grabbed the rope and it had slipped into the river with the boy. So they watched helplessly as two of their sons went under because nobody made it his job to hold on to the rope. This sad story serves as a parable for our times. Over the last century, many followers of Christ have lost their confidence in talking about Christ with other people, lost their assurance that there really are moral absolutes, and that the gospel of Jesus Christ is really true, because we've abandoned our faith in an authoritative Bible. Just as the rope was to pull the swimmers to safety, had not been tied to anything secure, the faith of many believers today flounders because it is no longer attached to belief in an authoritative Bible. During the last 100 years, many of us have been taught in churches, colleges, universities, that you can't believe the Bible because it's filled with errors and falsehoods. So Christ followers today don't know what they think because we no longer believe we have a sure word from God. Jesus encountered people who questioned the Bible. In Mark 12, 18 to 27, we find Jesus talking with Sadducees who questioned the truth of the Bible and they were trying to trick him. If you'd like to follow along with me, Mark 12, 18 to 27, we have Bibles under the seats in front of you. It's on page 1016. Then the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first one married and died without leaving any children. The second one married the widow, but he also died, leaving no child. It was the same with the third. In fact, none of the seven left any children. Last of all, the woman died too. At the resurrections, whose wife will she be since the seven were married to her? They put together this absurd story of a a widow uh, marrying seven different brothers and each one leaves her with no child. And so when they get to heaven, who's who's she going to be married to? They're trying to make the resurrection appear ridiculous. Jesus answers, are you not in error because you do not know the Scriptures or the power of God? Jesus asks, why don't you know the Scriptures? That's the profound question I want to consider with you today. And Jesus says they don't know the power of God. They don't believe in the miracles Jesus does, so they don't believe God can raise the dead to life. I believe Jesus asks the same question of us today. Why don't you know the Scriptures? We're weak in our faith when we don't know the Scriptures. Many people scoff at the Bible today. Why is that? Most people who denigrate the Bible probably believe one of, or both, of two arguments against the Bible. One, they don't believe in the supernatural. They don't believe the Bible because it records things that are historically unlikely, like miracles. Walking on water, raising the dead, those things don't happen. 
They can't happen. And so, since the Bible records those kind of stories, the Bible can't be true. This belief is based on naturalism, that for every effect in the world, there must be a natural cause. Now, I grant you that you shouldn't turn to the supernatural until the evidence leads you strongly in that direction. A tree falls over, you say, maybe the ground around it was just too wet. Could an angel have pushed the tree over? Maybe. But you don't go there until the evidence pushes you there. But to assume, to know enough about the universe to say that God, if there is a God, can never intervene supernaturally in this world is a pretty presumptuous assumption. I think where there needs to be a degree of humility as we look at historical documents and say, you know, God could raise Jesus from the dead, and Jesus could do miracles. If that's the best way to account for the evidence, let's investigate that. The second reason people don't believe the Bible is they believe the early church made things up. The argument, argument is that years after the fact, uh, early believers made things up that Jesus said and miracles that he did. They assumed that because followers of Christ were strong in their beliefs, it prompted them to color and twist the history they recorded. Historians usually operate on the assumption that uh, the historian has to prove an ancient uh, document false because we don't assume that people are compulsive liars. If we didn't believe that, that what we read in ancient history is true, we wouldn't know a lot about ancient history. For example, who recorded the Jewish Holocaust? Well, it's mostly Jewish people. They're the ones that created the museums and wrote the books and recorded eyewitness testimony of the horrific events of exterminating Jews in World War II. Now, they had an ideological purpose, but that doesn't mean they exaggerated and made false claims. Quite to the contrary, they worked all the harder to get the facts right so that something like this would never happen again. So to assume that early Christians made up facts is a big presumption. If you want to read uh, about this whole subject, Lee Strobel does a great job of it in his book, The Case for Christ. When people state that the early church made up accounts about Jesus, uh, they're starting with an assumption that the Gospels were written 40 to 70 years after Jesus died. The argument goes that Mark was written in the 60s, Luke in the 70s, Matthew in the 80s, John in the 90s. But even 40 to 70 years after Jesus' death is still time for many eyewitnesses to still be walking around. They could have uh, corrected, if, if, if falsehoods were being written down, they could have corrected that. By comparison, the earliest biographers of Alexander the Great were Arian and Plutarch. And they wrote 400 years after Alexander died in 323 B.C. Yet historians consider their works to be tr uh, trustworthy. In other words, the first 500 years after Alexander died kept the story about Alexander pretty much intact. But I believe the Gospels were written, written even earlier than the 40 to 70 years that some people claim. And we can find that by looking at the book of Acts. Book of Acts, the main character is the Apostle Paul. When the book ends, the Apostle Paul is under house arrest in Rome. Suddenly the book ends. What happens to Paul? We don't find out from the book of Acts. Presumably because Paul was still living when Luke ended the book of Acts. So we know that the book of Acts could not be, have been written any later than 62 A.D. Now, since Acts is part of a two-volume work, Luke, the gospel, uh, had to be written before that. And then Luke quotes from Mark a great deal. 
So Mark had to become before that. So allowing a year for each of those books to be written, we, uh, we can say that Luke was written no later than 61 A.D. and Mark was written no later than 60 A.D., maybe the late 50s. That's assuming Jesus died in 30 A.D. or 33 A.D., that's no more than a 30-year gap compared with the histories of Alexander, that's like a news flash. But that's not all. The oldest creed in terms of the historical Jesus is 1 Corinthians 15. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. In other words, this is a creed that was read each week in the early church, like we read the Apostle Creed sometimes. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Here's the point. If Jesus died in A.D. 30... The Apostle Paul came to Christ in A.D. 32. Then he was ushered into Damascus to meet a Christian named Ananias. Three years later, 35 A.D., he came to Jerusalem to meet the Apostles, Peter, James, and John. Sometime during that visit, he was handed this creed that was already formulated and being read in the early church. So that means we're not comparing 40 to 70 years with the what's considered uh, good history, 500 years for Alexander. We're not even comparing 30 years. We're comparing only two to five years. I mean, that completely takes the wind out of the argument that the resurrection was a myth made up over years later as legends corrupted the original gospels, the, the historical evidence. The creed was written when thousands of eyewitnesses were walking around, both followers and enemies of Jesus. If critics could have attacked it on the grounds that it was false and they were making up things, believe me, they would have. But that's exactly what we don't find. So I think we can pretty much throw out the argument that early Christians made up the accounts about Jesus. So, if we have good reason to discard the arguments against the Bible, do we have good reasons to believe in the Bible? There are all kinds of reasons why, but I only have time to share with you three. One, Jesus taught that what the Bible says is what God says. If we've established that the accounts of Jesus and His death and resurrection are reliable, and that the resurrection is the best evidence we have that shows that Jesus really was the Son of God, I think, could we all agree that what the Son of God teaches is true? Would you agree with me on that? Okay, so what does Jesus teach about the Bible, the authority of the Bible? All right, so I'm going to look at several scriptures with you. I want you to hang with me on this. Mark 2.25, Jesus answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? Many times in the gospel, Jesus says, have you never read? He's appealing to the Bible as the final authority on the subject. Why does he do that? Because he believes, he teaches that the Bible is God's word. That's why it has authority. Mark 12, 10. Haven't you read this passage of scripture? The stone the builders rejected? He does it again. He appeals to the Scriptures as the final authority. Why? Because he believes God is the author of Scriptures. Mark 12, 26, that's the passage we're looking at today. Now about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses in the account of the burning bush how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. Again, Why does he appeal to Scripture to end the discussion? Because he believes it's God's Word. Have you not read is equivalent to saying, don't you know what God says? The fascinating thing in this appeal 
as it all turns on one word. The Sadducees assumed that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were dead. But Jesus says, no, no, I, I, he doesn't say, I was the God of those three. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're living <coughs> in heaven. I raised the dead. I'm the God of the living. Mark, uh, which the point being that every word of Scripture is God's word. I was versus I am. Every word matters. Matthew 19, 4 to 5. Haven't you read, same thing, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, the two will become one flesh. Notice what Jesus does. He takes an Old Testament reference, Genesis 2, 24, which in his context is attributed not to God, but Moses just writing it. We expect Jesus to say, Scripture said... For this reason, but he actually says the Creator made them and said. So truly is God regarded as the author of all of Scripture that God and Scripture become interchangeable. He can say God says or Scripture says. It means the same thing. You with me? Shake your head if you're with me. Mark 12:35. While Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he asked, why do the teachers of the law say that the Messiah is the Son of God? David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, he quotes Psalm 110 that David wrote, and he says, David, speaking by the Holy Spirit. He's saying, in other words, all of Scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's what God says. No one can read through the Gospels without concluding that Jesus taught that what Scripture says is what God says. The Apostle Paul writes, The Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. Paul quotes God in Genesis 12, 3, All nations will be blessed through you. Instead of saying God announced that all people on earth will be blessed through you, as we expect, he says Scripture announced. He does the same thing. Scripture and God are used interchangeably. He writes, Paul again, For the Scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this purpose, that I might display my power in you. My name might be proclaimed in all the earth. A quote attributed to God in Exodus 9.16. Scripture has been personalized to say what God says. God and Scripture are used interchangeably. In other words, all of Scripture is what God says. Did that make sense? Two, Jesus teaches that his death is in fulfillment of Scripture. In Jesus' final 24 hours, what word or words does he use the most? I'm going to read six Scriptures for you. See if you can stay up with me, Cody, on these. First one is Matthew 26, 24. Look for what's the key word. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. I'll give you a clue. Key word is, it is written. Matthew 26, 31. Then Jesus told them, this very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written. Matthew 26, 54. Sticking with me, Cody? But how then would the scriptures, there's the key word, scriptures, be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? John 13, 18, I am not free referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill this passage of Scripture. Key word. John 17, 12, while I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe. By that name you gave me, none has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that the Scripture would be fulfilled. The last one, Cody, Luke 22, 37, it is written. So you'd expect just before he dies that the key words would be like love and sacrifice. But instead, it is written and Scripture topped the list. Meaning that the final days of Jesus' life were fulfilling Scripture. Scripture is so important to Jesus because it's God's Word. 29 different prophecies were fulfilled in Jesus' final week of his life primarily around uh, his death on the cross. What are the likelihood that 
29 scriptures could be fulfilled in one person. So, Emily, where are you? Come on and help me. Uh, Megan, Megan Sides, why don't you come help me? So, I have a little uh, deal here I am building. I have uh, 40 quarters, and I marked one with an X, okay? Your job is to find the one with the X. Would you blindfold Megan so she can't cheat? All right, so I bought 120, and I was going to stack them, but I learned at home very quickly that would not work. I can barely get... You're not peeking, are you, where I'm putting this? Okay, watch, folks. No peeking, Megan. All right, so your job is to pick one out of this stack. Okay, Megan, you can take off her blindfold, Emily. What are the chances she can find the mark one, do you think? Well, we'll see. All right, just pick it up wherever you think the, the one is. Yeah, you don't know. How'd you do? No, didn't get it. All right, it's way down here, sneaky. I put it way down at the bottom where you wouldn't think. All right, thank you, Megan. So, she can't, she can't pick one out of 40, but Peter Stoner says, what are the chances that Jesus would fulfill eight prophecies about his death? He says the chances are the same as covering all the state of Texas two feet high. This is only nine inches high, what I brought you. Two feet high with silver dollars. I tried to get silver dollars. The bank didn't have any. And, um, and then marking one out of all those silver dollars across the state of Texas, what are the chances of a person picking that out? That's the chances of Jesus fulfilling eight prophecies. But there are 29 that he fulfills. We could cover practically all the southern states with silver dollars. In other words, the chances are so slim that we have to conclude the Bible is a supernatural book written by God. And that's Jesus' whole point in talking about him fulfilling all these scriptures. Three, the Bible has the ring of authority. Mark writes, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You probably know this story. Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one's good except God. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, commit adultery, steal, false testimony, defraud, honor your father and mother. He said, I've, teacher, I've kept all these since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Now let me read you a very sad ending to this story. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. This story, like many accounts in the Gospels, particularly in Mark, is one that ends with no ending. One of the greatest arguments for the authenticity of the New Testament is precisely this sort of thing. The New Testament documents are not propaganda pieces made up with Jesus being the hero in every story. Jesus loses this one. The man walks away. And Jesus doesn't follow him and say, now wait a minute, come back here. What do you say we just, you just give away 20% of your wealth? No, the man walks away. The New, document, New Testament documents have the ring of truth because Jesus isn't always the hero and the disciples don't always look brilliant. Do you remember Larry King on CNN Live? He would interview people. I saw him interview somebody and he said this, the Bible was made up to explain things. A lot of people believe that. But the position just doesn't hold water. If you're making up something, you don't make up something that's completely opposed to human nature. Like, in order to follow Jesus and have joy, you need to sell all. You don't make up something like, in order to be first, you need to be last and the servant of all. Totally opposite our human nature. That's why the New Testament has the ring of truth. And you read through the Gospels, they're so unflattering to the disciples James and John asked Jesus, can, they, can we sit on your right and your left in, in the kingdom? 
And Peter takes Jesus aside when Jesus says he's going to die on the cross. He says, oh, no, 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 you're not going to die. I'm going to protect you. And the night Jesus is arrested, Peter denies Jesus three times. I mean, the disciples look like a bunch of self-serving, dull-witted idiots. If you're making up history, you don't write yourself into the account looking so stupid. The Bible has the ring of truth. You say, so what? All right, so what if we have an authoritative Bible? If we believe the Bible is God's Word and fully reliable, it seems to me we need to do two things. One, reflect on Scripture. Try to read something in the Bible every day. And then think about it. Reflect on it. That's why we make these journals. It's, it gives you something to read, and then it gives you a way to reflect. You can write and, and write your answers and think about what, what it means. Try to do it every day. If you only brushed and flossed your teeth once a month, how, what would the condition of your teeth and gums be in? We need God's Word every day. It's one way God has to speak to us. Two, obey Scripture. Obey it. James says, do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. So every time you read and reflect, this is another one of the things I love about our journals. Uh, a third of the questions have to do with putting it into practice. Okay, now what are you going to do about it? Commit when you read and reflect to putting something into practice because this is God's word. All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for what you taught, you teach about the Bible, that it is God's word, every word of it. And help us uh, hang on to it. Uh, and believe and know that it's authoritative and we can build our lives around it and help us read and reflect on it and obey it. In Jesus' name we pray.